Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the CEN Show. I am your host, Roski Mascani. And this evening on the panel, we got Professor Amin Ra and historian Joe Hembrick. Our guest for this evening is Brother Chihuahua. Brother Chihuahua is back for the second time. Well, he's been here more than once, but he's back for the second time for part two of the new faculty of thinking. So Brother Chihuahua, welcome back. And let's begin your presentation. Well, thank you each and every one. Greetings, Professor Ra, and all who is present here, Brother Rasaki, and um, what's the other brother's name? Historian Joe Hembrick. Joe Hembrick, my brother, good brother. Um, this experience of um, trying to put, bring out the, the new faculty of thinking has been quite a challenge, but at the same time, it's been intriguing and it's been uh, very, uh, what do you say, build a curiosity in me to go deeper into a few things. What I want to point out this evening is simply that we are basically under an experiment. It's, it's called sociology. Sociology is a brand new um, science that came about basically around the time of the uh, French Revolution, which started in 1789, ended in 1799. Uh, the French Revolution is where the aristoc aristocracy, the nobility, came up against the bourgeoisie, which were the working class of people, the, the land, the, the business owners, the, the industrial people. And they had a falling out. And this falling out led to the, the French Revolution. The privilege of the aristocracy was abolished by the bourgeoisie. The majority upper class nobles were executed there was a period of time called the Reign of Terror, where over 40,000 executions, primarily land-owning nobility, uh, courtiers and clergy were executed, beheaded. Many upper-class French immigrants immigrated to other countries. A typical, a typical. Example of this would be um, DuPont, founder of the chemical company. Those who stayed in France became political figures, military officers, as well as business owners. Those who were on the lower tier of the nobility. After 1794, the execution stopped, but the prosecutions continued. The economy was bad. The bourgeoisie, socialist elements, that control the government made life difficult for ex-nobles. DuPont tried to become a printer, but it was hard for him to make money. So he left, him, left and went to America with his family. Now, this is just one example. The DuPont Paint Company came out of France after the, after the French Revolution to come into America. Um, and that's how, that's who DuPont is. So these two classes, you can look at these two classes like Democrats and Republicans in America. So in Europe, and when I speak of Europe, I'm speaking about the Caucasian European, not the indigenous Aboriginal Europeans. Um, so during the French Revolution, the bourgeoisie left, led the charge against the nobility, ultimately shaping the emergence of the modern capitalist e economies and class societies. So in summary of the, what we just expressed, the nobles were a part of, excuse me, the nobles were a part of 
hereditary aristocracy with special privileges. The, the bourgeoisie represented the middle class, often associated with urban wealth, education, progressive political views. The conflict between these two classes played a significant role in historic events, like the French Revolution. Uh, Napoleon decision in 1802 to reinstate slavery not only betrayed the idea of French Revolution, it also condemned and established and, and, and condemned an estimated 300,000 people into a life of bondage for several more years before France de uh, definitively abolished slavery in 1848. The decision to reestablish slavery, slavery by Napoleon it in and of itself is a crime. So we have to understand that um, th this is what a, a Louis Gorges Tin is, which is an honorary president of the Representative of Council of Black Association in France wrote. And so we have to understand that during the French Revolution, the Blacks in France were treated horribly. Nobody speaks about the, them, but you know, you can do a, a search on them and I'll be presenting a sociological writing uh, a few months from now, I'm working on it right now. So this, this presentation encouraged me to do that. Um, so this is a part of the crime and the criminality perpetrated first amongst themselves, which are the two classes, the bourgeoisie and the aristocratic nobility coming out of Caucasian Europe and then flooding over into America because there were a mass migration coming over into America because of the world, the, you know, the French Revolution, which led also into World War I, World War II, and so on and so forth. Um, then we want to go into uh, 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 sociology which was conceived in 18, which is called the um, social disorganization. Social disorganization was conceived in 1892. The Chicago School first rose to international prominence as the epicenter of advanced sociological thought between 1915 and 1935. This first major body of research to specialize in urban sociology. So sociology is not an ancient science. It's a science that came out of um, Europe. And this is in the early, you know, before the French Revolution, during the French Revolution, after the French Revolution, this is when sociological science, the sociological science began to develop itself. Um, the term sociology was coined by French philosopher Auguste Comte in 1838. And it's for this reason is known as the father of sociology. The sociological deliberations initially forced on the emergence of the modern nation state, its institution, socialization units, and surveillance methods. So this is what they were dealing with. Sociology deals with uh, the emergence of the modern nation state, its institutions, its socialization units, and surveillance methods. So what we're going through are phases of a, a, a Caucasian European enlightenment. You know, this is sociology as a scholarly discipline emerged primarily out of enlightenment thought as a positive science of society shortly after the French Revolution. Its genesis owed its various key movements in the philosophy of science and the philosophy of knowledge arising in reaction to such issues as modernity, capitalism, urbanization, rationalization, secularization, colonization, and imperialism. So this is, this is sociology is really the science of Caucasian 
European thought. And this is why when we do research to find out about things, you always see a white person or a Caucasian that's talking about, you know, like Galileo and all of these different people, you know, like uh, so Isaac Newton um, and different people. Following World War II, which lasted from uh, September 1st, 1939 to September 2nd, 1945, a second school, Chicago school, arose with the com combined sy symbolic interactionism with the method, uh, with the method, excuse me, with the methods of field research, AKA ethnography, to create a new body of work. Luminaries from the second Chicago school include Howard S. Becker, Richard Cloward, Irving Goffman, David Mott, Robert K. Merton, Lloyd Holin, and Francis Fox Piven. These were, these are all Caucasians that's giving you the explanation of why things are the way they are. In the 1940s, in the 1940s through the 1970s, the second school of, uh, uh, of Chicago came out, uh, as, as was stated. Um, Larry Gaines and Roger Miller state in their book, Criminal Justice, in action, that crime is largely a product of unfavorable conditions in certain communities, according to the social disorganization theory. My question is, if you can come up with a social disorganization theory, I think it would be better if you deal with a social organization theory. How we keep keep um, um, communities in an organized manner and carry that through and let that develop into a more civilized state of existence. But their thing was, to study disorganization because their goal was how do we maintain certain people in a disorganized community and certain people in an organized community? Because organized community is a very simple thing. It's, a, it's an innate knowledge, it's innate reality. According to social disorganization theory, um, there are ecological factors. Now, when we're talking about um, ecological factors, we're talking about the environment, you know, the environment that is uh, responsible for so much of what goes on. So uh, we're talking about ecological factors that, um, that lead to high rates of crime, these in these communities and these factors link to constantly elevated levels of high school dropout, unemployment, deteriorating infrastructure, and single parent homes. Now, Gaines and that's Gaines and Miller. The theory is not intended to to apply to all types of crime, just street crime. This is what we're experiencing in our in our what we call black neighborhood street crime at the neighborhood level. At the neighborhood level, and black people never refer. You know, we talk about the neighborhood. I'm going back to my neighborhood. We all live in neighborhoods, not communities. That's like a, a program in all of us, in most of us. The theory has not been used to explain organized crime, corporate crime, or deviant behavior. That takes place outside neighborhood settings, see? So they were focused on simply the neighborhoods where specific socioeconomic group and racial groups exist. That way they focused, and the focus was disorganization, okay? Um, up to the beginning of the 1970s, this theory took a backseat to psychological explanation of crime. Up until the beginning of the 1970s, after they had assessed everything they wanted to assess in the first Chicago school, as what is it that we need to know? What, 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 what affects the, the neighborhood? Unemployment, high school dropout, single parent household, so on and so forth. So that will in increase of crime, poor poli policing, et cetera. Upon the beginning of the 1970s, theory took backseat to psychological explanation of crime, 
and a recent overview of social disorganization theory, including suggestions for refining and extending the theory, is a journal article by Kugrin and Weitzer, 2003. So now they gave it a back seat, and then now they want to 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 extend to refine it. How can we refine it, and how can we extend the theory? to make it last for a longer period of time into generations, generations. Now the second Chicago school focused more on architecture. So that's one thing to understand what the difference between the first Chicago school was and the second Chicago school. So the second Chicago school focused more on the, 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 the infrastructure, the buildings, you know, this is where um, affordable housing comes in. You know, people talk about like, you know, affordable healthcare is what they're giving the misnomer name of Obamacare. So you're talking about public housing is what you call affordable housing, which is what the government does. And just like the affordable health care is what the government does. And there's a reason why they call it Obamacare also, just like there's a reason why they call it affordable housing. Because uh, uh, it's for the poor, you know, really basically. Uh, what they're trying to say. Then you have urban sociology, okay? Uh, urban sociology is the study of the social organization and interaction of population groups within the built environment and physiological superstructure of highways, abandoned factories, um, suburban housing development, shopping malls, gated communities, public housing, manufacturing areas and the like created by modern capitalism. Now remember modern capitalism started, came into existence at the end of the French Revolution. And so the urban sociality examines social structures and processes of modern urban ways of life and its implication for city dwellers with the socio-cultural milieu. This rapid expansion of urban, urbanism re requires a comprehensive understanding of urban relevance phenomena and urban sociology attempt to focus on the urbanized social way of life and its impact on surroundings, the suburbs in particular. Now, the origin of the origin of, social, of urban sociology is not an ancient study. It began its career as a science in the last century only. In the last century only. Urban sociology being a branch of sociology itself is naturally much less old than the parent study, which is sociology, as a matter of fact, the, systema the, sy the systematic discipline of urban sociology came into being in the 20th century only. It's very important to understand that urban sociology came in in the beginning of the 20th century. So that's like 1900. All right, so as in the case of rural sociology, maximum work in the field of urban sociology has also being done in the United States of America, maximum. Professor House has defined urban sociology as the specialized study of city life and problems. So urban sociology is a sociological study of the various statistics among which is data among populations in cities, chiefly the study of urban areas where industrial, commercial, and residential zones converge. This practice leads sheds light on the cityscape, environment in, in borough areas of poverty in response to several different languages, lower quality of life, several different ethnic groups, and a low standard of police guardianship that all amounts to social disorganization. According to Haggerty in 2000, Urban sociology studies human groups in a territorial frame of reference with an emphasis 
on interplay between social and spatial organization and the ways in which changes in a spatial organization affect social and psychological well-being. So when we see and we ask our question, what's wrong with these young people? You know, our young people, we have to understand that they are being, we all are being exper experimented on. Through, and, so, and, and it's a sociological experiment, which spans generations of time. And events such as, you know, uh, 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 French Revolution, American Revolution, World War One, World War Two, nobody is keeping track of what's happening to the black people, the people of, of African descent, ascent. Actually, we're not looking at that, and we're just listening to what these white people are saying, and they and we're getting into their uh, 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 explanation. Uh, 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 and context of the events. Um, so now we're going into public housing or governmental subsidized housing or low income individuals and families has a long complex history. While it has been a source of affordable housing for many people, it has also been a subject of controversy and criticism. Public housing has its roots in the late 19th century, so that's 1880 something, you know, coming up like that, and early 20th century, when housing conditions in urban areas were often deplorable. The United States cities were rapidly industrializing and immigrants were pouring into in from Europe and Asia seeking work and better life. So the influx of Caucasian coming in from Europe and Asia, places like Ukraine, Russia, you name it, they're coming, they're coming into America. The Industrial Revolution is a part of the modernization which, 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 which the, the bourgeoisie began to go into like, 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 like a bat out of hell. They start industrializing like crazy, capitalizing on anything, setting up their system because they just defeated the noble aristocratic fuel system of, 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 of Caucasian European societies. And so now they were pushing into America, which is, you know, the new world. And they were coming in rapidly industrializing and the immigrants were pouring into Europe and Asia seeking work and a better life. However, housing for these newcomers was often overcrowded, unsanitary and unsafe. In response to these conditions, social reformers began to advocate for government intervention to improve housing for the poor. Now, under the New Deal, this is when the New Deal came in, the Roosevelt New Deal, the Housing Act of 1937 was passed and launched to start the federal public housing program. These goals of, of, of the project was to provide affordable housing for low-income families while also creating jobs and stimulating the economy. But the program came to, to became a detriment to, to most black families living in America. Because what they did was they moved the black families out of certain areas because those areas were close to where the industrialization was going on. They moved the other Caucasian thing that were coming in as a result of what was going on in Europe they became the people that were making all the money. Now they were hired by the industrialized society as America was coming up from the South was agrarian. The North became industrial. And so they, they would bring this force in. It was taking the black people who journeyed from the South to the North because of the Emancipation Proclamation to might find a better life. And when they did, they were constantly being shipped around, shipped around, shipped around, make accommodation. This is criminal. This is crime and the criminality of the society. The crime and the criminality is in fact the very society, American society, which black people are uh, uh, existing in right now. So according to the National Low Income Housing, uh, before the Housing Act was officially passed, there was a, a Tetchwood home in Atlanta, Georgia, was one of the first public housing projects to be constructed under the New Deal in 1935. 
Sadly, hundreds of black families were evicted from the area to create the 604 unit white only neighborhood. Crime again and criminality. That same year, the Supreme Court held a ru ruled the federal government lacked authority to seize property from, uh, no, through eminent domain, domain, but local PHAs did have this authority allowing them to act without proper oversight regarding the, the placement of public housing according to the, the, the National Low Income Housing Initiative. More crime seen now within the leg legislative body of the same system. The federal government continued to create segregated public housing because that's what the public housing were in the beginning. It was a form of segregating black people from the opportunities of the industrialization of America. So public housing throughout the late 40s, but the practice eventually came to and halt in 1940 after the Supreme Court struck down the FHA for the unfair practice. The development following World War II, public housing experienced a period of rapid growth as the federal government poured money into building new projects. This is the second Chicago school. They had to come up with the architecture for that. That's what the second Chicago school was for. Because they had to accommodate the industrial revolution, which is the capitalist way, profit and progress into building new projects. This was driven in part by post-war housing shortage due to returning soldiers and their families needing places to live. It was also influenced by the false socio-political notion that public housing could help solve social problems such as poverty, crime, and social and, and racial segregation. During this period, many large, during this period, many large um, areas on the outskirts of cities, these undertakings were obviously part of the second Chicago school, which centered around urban architecture. These projects were designed to provide modern, affordable housing for low-income families, but they also had unintended consequences. They often became magnets for crime and social problems and were criticized for isolating poor people from the rest of society. The poor people that we're talking about here are the Black people, the Black Americans, African Americans, whatever term we want to give ourselves or they want to label, label on us. Sadly, though, even though housing segregation was fully outlawed by the 1960s, the production of segregated housing communities persisted throughout the late 60s and 70s, according to Holmes now. So this is these are some of the, the dynamics that are happening within the, 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 the 60s and 70s that spurred the civil rights movement. It became a, a festering abscess. And the civil rights movement is nothing more than the explosion of it. During this time, you had the Black Panthers and all these were, were moving. You know, this were our movement at that time. You had people like Nina Simone and others, J James Brown. The music was also doing some things that, you know, we don't really see and they don't really talk about. In the decades that followed, public housing faced a number of challenges. One of the biggest was the stigma against living in public housing. Many people saw it as a sign of failure and felt that it was a trap that kept people in poverty. Additionally, funding for public housing was often inadequate, leading to lack of maintenance and deterioration. Now we're talking about in the 60s and 70s, this is when the black people now were more involved. This is when the funding becoming that adequate. But prior to that, it was very adequate, you know? Um, so there's leading to a lack of maintenance and deterioration of buildings. In recent years, there has been shift towards more mixed income approach to public housing, which involves blending of uh, affordable housing with market rate units. This approach is intended to reduce the concentration of poverty in specific areas while also providing affordable housing for the wide range of people. But this is nothing more than ecological, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, secession. The history of public housing in the United States is a complex one with both successes and failures, said. Um, the failures 
The successes are, the predomin are, are predominantly ex the experiences of newly arriving Europeans and Asian immigrants. The failures are the experience of the Black Americans, while public housing has provided affordable housing for millions of the low-income families, it has also been the subject of criticism and controversy. Okay, so Black communities, the Black communities, um, therefore it is important to find new approaches to public housing that are sustainable, effective, and responsive to the needs of the Black community they serve. For decades, uh, for decades, the, the American government's afford, uh, efforts have relied on the construction and subsidized housing plots, more commonly known as projects, to house Black Americans. The term originally used to describe what city planners believe would amount to improvement projects instead has become synonymous with inner city blight and crime. Today, urban legend urban legend, news reporters, news reports, and rap lyrics detail the deadening effect, effects of concentrated poverty and misguided public policy that these projects have become. Okay, so that's the, the section on that. I'm just gonna run through some things. I'm trying to get through the, the I, I, I feel like, you know, we're dealing with a lot of things. One of the main things to point out the crime, that the crime is not innate. It, it is a systemic and systematic problem. You know, we're talking about the black codes. Before the war, North, Northern states that had prohibited slavery, now after the war, white legislators passed black codes, AKA slave codes. Another example of crime and criminality. The black codes, the slave codes were criminal. It was against the constitution, but the legislators were the criminals at this point within the governmental system, local, as well as extending into the federal government. Connecticut, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and New York, these are the Northern states enacted laws to discourage free blacks from residing in those states. These are Northern locations. We have been programmed to think that all of this stuff was just a Southern thing. No, but it was the North, because remember, it was the North that supported and funded the plantation owners in the South. They were also denied equal polit political rights. This is in the North, the right to vote, the right to attend public schools, and the right to equal treatment under the law. Black code were part of a larger pattern of, of Democrats trying to maintain political dominance and suppress the newly emancipated African-Americans. Now, this is the African-Americans back then were refer referred to as free men and free women. They were particularly concerned with controlling the movement and the labor of free men and free women. Black African-Americans and Black African American women. As slavery had been replaced by a free labor system, this was the fear. Now there's a free labor system. We can compete now, right? Although free men and free women had been emancipated, their lives were gradually restricted by the Black Codes. The defining feature of the Black Codes was vagrancy law, which allowed local authorities to arrest African Americans for mine infractions, sometimes nothing at all crime and criminality again. So we are not criminals, but the, the dominant society and the media paints us in that way because of the very laws that they have instituted within the very system that we have been emancipated from and into. Okay. And commit them in voluntary and commit them to involuntary labor. This period was the start of the convict lease system, also described at, by Douglas Blackman in the 2008 book, Slavery by Another Name. Okay, so these are all the things that's been documented to show the cr crime and the criminality of the very system that we're in. And remember, 
as I'm putting this down, think new faculty of thinking, new faculty of thinking. It, it, you know, for many of us, we may say that's nothing new, but it will be as I go further down the road, not necessarily in, in this presentation, but presentations to come. In sociology, the social nation theory, theory developed you know, in Chicago, as I said earlier. So we say now that the theory suggests that among determinants of a of person uh, later, illegal activity, residential, residential lo location is, 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 is as significant or more significant than a person's individual characteristics, like their age, gender, or race. For example, the theory suggests that youths from disadvantaged neighborhoods participate in a subculture, which is a culture away from the, the mainstream culture, which approves of delinquency and that these youth does acquire criminality in this social and cultural setting. Like what we see now, when we talk about gang violence, it's as if the black community approved, you know, when the crack, the, 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 the crack epidemic came through, it was like, you know, it was like a way that black folks would make money because, you know, some of them was down there, like they're, they're gonna make that money. A man's gonna do what he gotta do to feed his family. And, and, and it became like almost a normal thing, you know, in the black community. You know, we beat against it, we fight against it, but it's true. Um, these were all by design. The, the, the Oliver North story, guns for drugs, where, you know, the politicians and what you call it, the, 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 those with diplomatic immunity were bringing in the drugs. And, and, and they had no knowledge of how to distribute drugs. So what they do, they went to the black community, the neighborhood. They knew that these people were desperate because they created the desperate scenario and injected this stimuli, which is the drugs. And the drugs were, you know, the, 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 because of the intelligent ingenuity and the genius of the black uh, uh, genome, we created crack and quadrupled the, the profits from the raw cocaine that was coming in through the diplomats. And, and, you know, the rest is the history. Also, as we move forward, while this is all going on, we have to understand that we're making music. We're making phenomenal music in jazz and blues. And it's, 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 it's as if, as, as we are being programmed and reprogrammed, because a lot of people ask the question, you know, the white people, they tricked us out of this and that and, and so forth. But the truth be told, we actually gave them. We, we, we took the transfer of cover, power and we transferred it to them. That This was the heights of our ancestors and their, our civilization. We were so highly civilized and so highly um intelligent that we knew that these things were going to happen. We transferred this. What we what did we give these people? Today we call these people capitalists. We call them imperialists. We call them we call them colonialists. We call them um, modernists. We call them you know different terms, but these are fancy words. When they first came upon our ancestors they came in the form of, as marauders. They were marauders. They were plunderers, looters. Their culture was simply to go wherever they needed to go to see who they could kill and what they could plunder. They instituted Things like terror, what we call terrorism today. Things like rape, you know, and, and plunder, just stealing, stealing. That's all they were, they were thieves. What we did was we were so civilized, we could, like, who are these people? And what are they doing? Why are they behaving like this? Obviously, they don't have uh, an intelligence. They're lacking something. So what we did, we were very cordial with them. We fed them, we cooperated with them because we knew one thing. We knew that they would go to sleep at some point. And when you're sleeping, you can't, you, you have to cease from all of those 
marauder activities. At that time, we then retrieved all of the source of their power, which is what? The same thing they're using today, threat of nuclear uh, 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 destruction. They, 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 they're funding one another with weapons of mass destruction. This is what they do. And so once we took away their ability to terrorize not only themselves and one another, but others, when they awoke and they saw that they were without their power, they became afraid, they became concerned, and we calmed them down and we told them, don't worry, you don't need those. We'll give you something better. And what we gave them was information. What we gave them was intelligence. We embedded intelligence in them. This is the initial Caucasian. This was when we were in power. We ruled and the, the, our religion, religious body, our uh, teaching uh, modalities was what the whole entire planet fed off. But these people came up out of an evolutionary realm. They evolved, you know, and there's parts in the scripture to show you they are part of the evolution. And when they came, we gave them an intelligence, knowing that they would use this intelligence to overthrow us and do all this. Because and some would say, well, why did we do this? We did that because we knew civilization. We know this, we knew that civilized people, if civilized life will continue forward. And we know that civilizations rise and civilizations fall. And we were, we knew that we were immortal because we are God with the big G. We had conquered the God with the little G and entered into an age of, of, of high sophistication and high intelligence, a, a, a divine essence of, 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 the, of the supreme being the consciousness. So when it came upon us, we were doing things that would just amaze them. They blew their mind. But we understood that life is, is a circle of energy. And so we did that. They were able to take over and, and we, we had sown that seed. So in that seed came the generations of, of them. Now, the, first, the generation, as it continued, there was a generation called the Beat Generation. Okay, uh, Brother Trevara. Yes. Before you start, we've been going for about 40 minutes straight. So what we want to do is we want to get the the uh, panel involved a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. Then we, then well, we can continue. Yes. So uh, we have, I don't know, uh, uh, Kebulon Mayat. Oh, Sister Alkebulan, Andrea. Yes, yeah, she's a greetings, she's family. A beautiful sister. Wonderful. Welcome. Do you have any? Do you have a question or a comment for Brother Chihuahua? Um, I'm just grateful for the platform, and um, I missed the first uh portion of it, but um, I don't have a question. I just want to express gratitude for this type of dialogue taking place to raise the vibration and energy of consciousness for our people. So I give thanks to all of you for being here and making this happen. Okay, I appreciate you attending. Thank you. And Thank uh, you, we're, we're here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays weekly. So we would like to have you back. Yes, so yes. Thanks for coming. And uh, okay, so I'll go to uh, Brother Machenda. Uh, no, no comments. Uh, you know, interesting uh, topic and, uh, you know, great information. Appreciate, as usual, Brother Chihuahua coming on. And uh, But no, I, if, I'll continue to uh, listen to once everybody, uh, you know, give their little commentary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, historian Joe. Uh, yeah, greetings, family. Uh, uh, most of the historical stuff I'm aware of, uh, I'm waiting to hear, uh, you know, uh, you know, the new faculty of thinking as far as the public housing and projects go, you know, I grew up in them, 
And, uh, you know, we had a, uh, we had a uh, center where you can go and check out certain equipment and, you know, like more lawnmowers, buffers, garden tools, and this sort of thing to, uh, you know, so you could work around your own little unit that you stayed in. Uh, we had a big wreck area down there. But from what I understand, most of the ones in the West uh, were the leftover housing from people that were in the military. Mm -hmm. uh, what not uh, as far as the social sociology aspects go I used to be a social major before I became a history major and uh, I agree with the programming uh, uh, you know with some of the theories like the looking glass self and other stuff like that uh, but I'm waiting to and as far as the you know industrialization goes and all that, I thought he was gonna touch on the fact of where they were getting all these materials to do their industrialization, uh, which was in Africa, and still to this day. But anyway, just listening along, trying to trying to catch what the new faculty of thinking ought to be according to the brother. So. Okay, you you want to uh, touch on that, brother Chawara, where where they got up the materials and everything? For yes, well, uh, as far as uh, bro brother Joe, you you were saying about the get the materials for the uh, industrialization. No, I, I, we, we all we we all know that it's got from Africa. Okay. Okay, I, I didn't know if you wanted him to touch on that. Okay, I'm gonna go to Professor Ron and then Chihuahua. You can. But, but what I really want to uh, him to speak on is the new faculty of thinking. That is the title of his presentation. Uh, other uh, other than how you know sociology was developed and all of that. Uh, uh, that's what I'm Okay. Okay. So for the for the. Uh, we gonna go to Ra, and then we are gonna come back to that, uh, brother Chihuahua. I yield to that. I yield to okay, that. Okay, so, so we want to hear about the the new faculty of thinking as it relates to what you were just saying. Well, you see, what all the things that I've said to this point is to legitimize the new faculty of thinking because number one, the new faculty of thinking. That whole concept and that whole statement comes from Mortimer Plano, uh, the 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 Rastafar the Rastafari teacher of Bob Marley, the 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 individual who went on was sent to with along with others to the different African nations to on a fact finding journey. These information I will bring out later in terms of specifics on Martimo Plano. I have documents also that I will introduce, but I, you know, for the, the new faculty of thinking, just understand this, that the faculty is your psychological as well as your physiological balance and how they work together. So give you an example. If we are not within the faculty of ourselves, then we have no control over ourselves. Therefore, therefore we have no power. The man who has control of himself by compulsory is able to have also self-discipline. So the, the faculty of think your faculty is that consciousness, that awareness, that self, that divine consciousness, that consciousness, it's an immortal energy. It's, a, it's, a, it's within each and every one of us, but to different degrees. 
But what is the, 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 the prescribed degree is that it, it is to be, we are to be within ourselves 100%, not 99.9%. That way we will have full control of our faculty of, and, and we will control what happens to us and what doesn't happen to us, uh, how we eat and how we will not eat. So the new faculty is not like something new in terms of new. The new faculty is something that's there that we have put on back burner, that we have not been looking at, that we have not been utilizing. Malcolm X talks about it. He says one of the things that the thought of the new faculty is we close the door. We're still talking about Democrats and Republicans and who you gonna vote for and who you gonna vote for when for years and years and years and years and years and years, both Democrats and Republicans had us in shackles and chains. And then when the Emancipation Proclamation came by, they both were participating in Jim Crow. And even to this day, it's a Democratic and Republican controlled system and none of us are getting anything out of it. And I'm, when I say none of us, I'm speaking about the, the Black people, the African-Americans, the, the, the Negroes, or the Negroids, you know, those terminologies, the, the earth tone people. Malcolm has called us the Black, the Brown, the Red, and the Yellow, the indigenous people. So, you know, the new faculty is on that. That's why I'm, I'm taking this approach now, because when it, when it comes to to break down the new faculty, you know, I have to, this is what I'm doing in order to legitimize that position. It's time for us to close the door. It's time for us to look at each other with love, one perfect love. It's time for us to look at each other with one perfect peace. It's time to look at, for us to look at each other with, 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 a, with a, a spirit of, 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 of cooperation of working together, of harmonious unity, with, 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 with the spirit of fearlessness and okay. courage. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. Yeah, so, so, so this is why you know, I'm, I'm doing this to show how we have actually been programming <clears throat> the society in which we live in as it has been programming us. People like Dr. Ben, uh, Bobby Hemmett, um, uh, uh, Phil Valentine, uh, Ivan Van Sertima, uh, Dr. Savi, and, and I mean, I, the, the list goes on. This was Black Genius. That was the first one I was talking about, the Black Authority, uh, the New Faculty of, think, of, of Thinking, the Black Authority. So this one's called the New Faculty of Thinking, Crime and Criminality. And so to show all of that is to show the need and the, the urgency for us to, to take on the new faculty of thinking, you know, to begin to say race first, like Marcus Garvey told us to do, you know, for us to return to our Pan-African and, 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 and our Black nationalists and our, you know, the Panthers, what were the Panthers? You know, they were feeding the children bad breakfast in the morning for the children. And then they were setting up fun. health clinics. It's time for us to, 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 to close the door. And, and, you know, that's why I was getting into the beat generation. You know, this were, we were influencing this, the jazz, the Coltrane, Coltrane and the jazz era was working, was actually programming the American society for change, you know, for, for morality and, and, and things. So, out of the beat generation, you have a group of people called themselves the Beatniks. And this movement started by a group of authors who worked to explore and influence American culture and politics in the post-World War II era. The bulk of, of their work was published and popularized by the silent uh, generator, generationers in the 1950s, better known as Beatniks. The central elements of beat culture are the rejection of standard narrative values, making a spiritual quest, <clears throat> a 
exploration of American and Eastern religions and the rejection of economic materialism, explicit portrayal of the human condition, experimentation of psychedelic drugs and sexual liberation exploration. And you know, uh, Woodstock is one of those big events that happened during this time. You know, we were we were making music, man. We was we were doing awesome stuff. You know, we we created the whole popular music of uh, America. You know, in the 1950s, the beatnik culture formed around the literary movement. Although this was often viewed critically by major authors of the beat movement in the 1960s. Elements, elements of the expanding beat movement were incorporated into the hippie. Now remember, the hippies connected to the Panthers. And you see, the, these are the doors now that we have to close. We don't need the help. We're not rejecting them. We're saying we are accepting help from us. And if, if, help, if we don't want to help ourselves, that's okay. Whoever is going to be black, be moral, be just, they say no justice, no peace. Well, no justice, we're going to create our peace. All right. We, you know, the activists going to be the activists. And, and the, the voters are going to be the voters. They, they have to do what they must do, what their spirit, what their life energy guides them to do. Okay, gotcha. I'd just like to recommend a couple of books. Uh, it's a volume one and two, uh, A Cultural Genocide. And I believe us practicing what you claim we practice covers that. Let, let's, let, let's move on to Brother Ross. Bonnie Johnny, everyone. It's good to see everyone online. Uh, Brother Shirai, I want to say Asante Sala for your brilliant presentation and your new way of uh, trying, well, your way of encouraging us to look at society different uh, and within our own frame of reference. And that's consistent with. Don't let the teach the oppressor be our teacher. Yes. Rowdy G. Woodson said uh, back in the 30s, the uh, miseducation of the Negro. We can go back further than that to the black newspapers that focused on socialization and resistance and abolition of, of our condition. Uh, the whole most black people all the way up to the 40s, 50s, were in rural areas in the South. And when you look at the sociology of thought, our major concern was morbidity and um, what they call mortality. You know, infant birth and how long you can live. Uh, it's a challenge to get people to think different. Because as you say, many of us are programmed, whether we went to school or not, we learned from the social, social interaction, from mass media and social media now. But the point is, is that I, I can't agree with you more than the fact you know, I majored in sociology, as Joe did, and in, in, in before he changed the history, and uh, I, that's why I got my BA in. And I used to take over the class because I wouldn't let them teach mythology about us as a people. And some instructors just let me roll because I could teach, and that was as a student. My point is, is that uh, we've always struggled to see the world different. Harriet Tubman saw the world different. Frederick Douglass saw the society different. Uh, uh, Denmark Vesey, Eric Blyden. We can go all the way up the line that we've been struggling 
and educating our people, those that will receive the education for a different point of view throughout our history, going all the way back to Africa, as Joe constantly says, uh, you know, we, we resisted the Holocaust of enslavement and we've been struggling uh, throughout our history as a people. And when you look at sociology, you have to look at methods of research, statistic data, and the various forms of how these institutions, as you were pointing out, Rashad, how they're still affecting many of our children. But crime was created by America. It was a crime for them to come here and do what they did to the Native Americans. It was a crime what they did to us. And they did it to each other. You know, and they're still doing it to each other. They, but they get us to call ourselves black on black crime, but they never talk about white on white crime or yellow on yellow crime. We, we, they have taught many of us to see things between um, pointing out the negativity and the uh, wrongdoing of African people because they're in their own communities, right? You know, you go out to your community and you, you, that was against the law for years. Now they had different classes, caste system, race system, sexism, capitalism, and materialism, and militarism, militarism, militarism. And th these are the four, I mean, the four or five pillars that make up this society. And I couldn't agree with you more than to try to educate, motivate, and give a people a sense of purpose and direction by pointing out the flaws of the society and the history of the society for those that need it and those that want to learn it. The problem is it's getting a class to do it. We can put it out on the media, we can put it out on YouTube, but if they're watching Tic Tac and people twerking and people uh, hustling and lumping, it, it's a challenge, man. You know how it, and that's from the elementary schools all the way up because the primary educating unit, as you know, is the family. You know, and if, but you have to have educated family members, uh, not educated by white folks. But as Malcolm said, that you know, families that knew how to think for themselves rather than the ideas, subliminal suggestions, and seductions that the society get, out, get many people and everybody in this society to accept their version of society for the money. It was a good presentation. Appreciate your work. And I'll, I'll be glad when you finish your product because I think it'll be uh, worthy of a lot of people that need to read it. Thanks, Rashiki. Okay, appreciate it, Professor Rock. Chawara, we got a, a few more minutes, so you can bring, uh, go ahead and come with some closing comments or closing words, and then we're going to we're going to look forward to the part three. Yes, you know, uh, well, you know, the, the music of jazz brought a lot of change within American society. Um, you know, it, it was a whole nother language, you know. And if you if you look it up, you'll see that um, there was a lot of, you know, Cap Calloway, you know, you know, like the word goofy, dapper, big cheese, gumshoe. You know, as a detective, you know, heebie-jeebies, you know, the feeling of being uncomfortable or, or scared. These are all jazz terms. Jazz brought into, began to, to program white America from a generational standpoint. And, and, and they began to open up. So the old generation, the, the traditionalism generation had to had to be left behind because you know the new generation of Caucasians began to create new traditions and new outlooks 
and 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 so through the music we were, we were able to advance the society american society and many of us don't see it in that manner because you know we don't normally talk on that level of conversation you know jive what's that you say 30s and 40s in the united states were a defining time in the u.s push great depression world war ii in the midst of ever-changing climate where jazz and jive and slang the, the, the life of the jazz musician took hold you know, in America and, and began to influence the entire society, you know, through from blues music coming on through, creating this, this shift, you know, and then you have uh, musicians, artists like, you know, um, uh, for instance, jive wasn't just a language for describing jazz music, the jazz singing, but it also acted as a secret language for drug use and perhaps some more unsavory practices that being said, when wasn't there a time when slang was used to talk about things that folks would rather keep between each other? Jive had that element to it as well with terms like reefer, pot, being initially introduced to talk about marijuana. And, and you know, when we, we talk about marijuana, and you go to, even in Jamaica, for instance, the true name is called ganja and marijuana. You know, a lot of people argue with me on that, but you know, we, we don't know nothing about no marijuana. We always know the bush as ganja. And, and a lot of the strains that we hear now, marijuana, Mary Jane, or whatever you call it, is, is nothing more than what they did, you know, to, to, to change and to bring it into their form of understanding. Um, there was a whole, the, the music brought a whole language, you know, and in people like, um, what's his name? Um, uh, Coltrane, John Coltrane. You know, he was like, he was one of the, 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 the real serious people that brought that to, to the forefront. Because he was, he, he he did great albums that were showing his the spiritual connection to the music, you know. Uh, they were they, and it created that improvisational spirit, symbolized the creativity and the breaking of artistic boundaries, you know, and the the the, the, the gutsy energy of jazz to, to to go beyond, you know, individuality and unity. Jazz celebrates individuality. Musicians express their unique voices through improvisation, solos, and personal interpretation. Simultaneously, jazz is a symbol of unity. Its infectious rhythms and emotional depth resonate with people all of all backgrounds, of all social barriers, and creating a, a sense of togetherness. This is the same thing with the reggae. The reggae became another form uh, uh, in a sense, where jazz left off at and where jazz became so accepted, here comes a new form bringing about that, that sense of, of nationalism, that sense of unity, that sense of, of standing up, that sense of, of Black power, Black national, nationalism, uh, Pan-Africanism, that, that pride, you know, that fearless energy. That was also a, a, an energy to unite. And if you know this, the hippie culture took to that just as they took to the jazz, just as they took to the, the Panther movement. And, and all of this is, is, is when, while we're thinking we're being programmed, we're not realizing that we're actually programming the larger society. They're following our lead. They'll never admit it. But as you see the world and the paradigm is changing, you're seeing the difference. So the question becomes, if Russia today, this is off the top of my head, if Russia today can say, hey, this is what I found and everybody in the Bible is black. And my nation, the Russian people, the Russian nation, from this day forward, will embrace and follow the black Christ. Now, People can say what they want to say. 
but the facts and the truth is the truth. And 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 what will you be? Will you be the black Christ? Or will you say that's just a belief system? You know, are you the color of the earth? Or you or will you just say you're a human being? Because what is a human being? If you're not reflecting the creation itself, then a human being then is a, a, a belief system, maybe. A, a philosophical thought, a theory, philosophical theory. But to accept a part of the new faculty of thinking requires us to accept. What are we accepting? Fallible knowledge and infallible knowledge. What is fallible knowledge? Fallible knowledge is knowledge that can be misconstrued, that is not perfect. Knowledge that belongs to the, the God with the liturgy. The mortal man is the little G God. His mortality gives him knowledge that, you know, is, it constantly needs to be fixed and, you know, built upon, and it can only take him but so far. But infallible knowledge takes you beyond the grave. But infallible knowledge and fallible knowledge exist here in this space and time, which is called present time, a part of the new faculty of thinking requires us to understand that there is no past and there is no future. And that we don't, we don't feed on that concept of past and future. We feed on the truth and the reality and the realness of the present time. We know that the past is now and we know that the future is now. We know that karma is not something that is gonna to come to you, but karma is something that is existing as you are creating it. So as you create karma, you can change karma at the, at the very next moment, you can change it because you are in present time jurisdiction and existence. We think so much on future when we ought to be thinking on generation. And this is the new faculty of thinking, one of the aspects of it anyhow, is to think in terms of generation and not in terms of future. Because when you think in terms of future, the only thing we're talking about is I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a, a doctor. Now, my career, see, that's what we're talking about. But by the time you achieve your career, what happens? You got to go back to school because now your career is outdated. It's no longer functional. So future is a dysfunctional form or an incomplete form. It's a part of the mortal man, which is mortality. The fallible information will only remain here and will only serve you here. The infallible information will carry you here, but carry you beyond the grave. So you have a choice. Since you are the, the little God, which is the flesh, and you are the big God, which is the word, which is within you, you choose. The only way you can choose is to accept. I accept both of them. That's why I'm a Rasta. I'm not a Rastafarian. That's another thing to understand that the new faculty of thinking is a Rasta conception in the way in which I'm producing, pre pre presenting it. We found out that that is the only thing that will save us is a new faculty of thinking that will save black people, that will save our people and will save humanity and the world and creation from the destruction of marauders. Looters, plunderers, polluters, immoral, immorality. So we say, you have a choice. I, I have experienced the little God and I love the little God with all my heart. But now I step into the different level of consciousness of the big God and I accept that. Why is acceptance important? Acceptance is important for you to understand. Without accepting a situation, how will you understand it? If you reject it, you cannot understand it. Some people have situations in their lives that are very negative and hurt them. They feel bad about it and they reject it. They say, no, I don't want that. And they reject it and they throw it away. And when you reject a thing, you're not really going to receive the understanding of it. The key is to understand it retrieve the teachings from it 
and then you move forward. So nothing is ever wasted. The experience, uh, uh, although it was bitter, although it was heart-wrenching, although it was disappointing, although it was painful, because I simply accepted, without even having understood it, the acceptance opens up to the door of understanding. And so this is the new faculty of thinking is based upon these fundamental principles. If you are to know the God, which you are, which is that big G God, you have to accept that God and accept that you are that God because you have been told by those that came before you that that God is within you. And you have been told by those that came before you that that God is omnipresent, omnipotent, and um, omnipresent, omnipresent, and it's, it's, three, it's three characteristics. Omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnipotent. And that God, if you're told that this God is within you, so if this God is within you and you're mortal, you have also been told that this God is the word, and this God took upon itself flesh and dwelt amongst man. These are just religious phrases and cipher that we have to understand. They're not just, it's not just a belief system. Religion is not just a belief system. R religion is a, is a demonstrable system. True religion, that is, is a demonstrable system. It cannot be demonstrated, then it's not something one should actually hold on to because beliefs are a part of the fallible realm. To know and to understand is an infallible truth. And so this is what the new faculty of think, thinking is based on. It, it, you, can, you can tell me, you can show me a new faculty of thinking. It's not a specific number of things. It is a holistic and overall existence. As I have said in the past, life is my religion, my culture, and my tradition. And without life, all things cease to be in existence or even just cease to be, period. So life is necessary for anything and everything to be available, whether it's visible or invisible, mortal or immortal. So we, we make a choice what we choose is very important. You know, Brother morality Toronto, is important. We're going to have to take our pause. We we come sure. up on the 7, yeah. 20, 21. I give thanks. Brother Chihuahua, we're going to continue with the new faculty of thinking. The information yes. is, is information that people need to listen to and, and decipher and and do their best to understand because I'm I've been dealing with you or or I wouldn't say dealing I've been in in conversation with you for months now and I'm I'm getting some understanding of where you're coming from and I and I can identify with with most of it so people just have to you know take it in and and see what they can get from it because it's I think it's very important and empowering what you talk about. So we I, want to thank, we I want to thank everybody for coming. And you know, we're here on Tuesdays and Wednesdays every week. It's rare that we miss a week. If we do, it's something going on highly significant. <laughs> like my anniversary is coming up. So I may miss one or two times in July, but we, and I still may be here, but I, I You're will. You're always here, brother. I welcome everybody that comes and, and converse and teach. And that's what we're doing. We're learning from everybody, Community Education Network. So next week's guest is we got our host coming back, Dr. Sherry Randolph. And the guest that she's she has invited is Shelly Johnson. And the topic is Proposition 19, the destruction of generational wealth. So that should be very interesting. And we're going to take our pause. Professor Rod, do we have anybody for next week? You're on mute. Uh, 
Uh, I'll let you know about the mayor of Compton uh, tomorrow. I'm going to try to reach you. All right. I, I tried to call. They said she was out of town, so I'm going to try to call her again tomorrow. Excellent. That'll, that'll be a good one. So thanks for coming, everyone, and come back, please. And I will, we will see you then. So until next time, Conscious Corner, and each one teach one. Everybody have a beautiful evening. Ubuntu.